that, that somebody else has uh, when we are wanting something that doesn't belong to us, when we are resentful against other people, it unravels us. And I, and I use that word unravel because it seems to me that it often does not happen in one moment. Uh, jealousy is something that just kind of chips away at us. It just picks away at us until, until there's a collapse. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible about finding threads on my clothes and pulling them. You guys do that too? You know you're not supposed to do that, you know? But I always do it. I'm just, it's a temptation. That thread's just begging to be pulled, you know? And, and uh, as you do that on a sweater or, or any other thing, pretty soon it just starts coming apart. And this is what we see here in the life of Saul. His, his life is unraveling. Um, you know, he could have had a decent life uh, after after sinning so badly that he lost uh, the kingdom, he lost his right to the throne. After that, he still could have had a decent life. He wouldn't have been the man that he could have been, but he could have been a better man than he ended up being. Yeah. And this was all his choice. Mm -hmm. You know, God did not want this for him. God gave him free will. God gives each one of us free will. And uh, Saul made terrible decisions. And so um, we're going to be, Lord willing, tackling here the last part of chapter 18 and all of chapter 19. When we're going through uh, the Old Testament like this, and there's a lot of what's called narratives, it's just a story. Um, we're just gonna try to hit the high points. There's a lot of repetition now that happens. I mean, David runs, Saul chases him, tries to kill him, David gets away. David runs, Saul, you know, it's just over and over again. So we're gonna be trying to just find the high points and the main points uh, of these stories. and so. Uh, let me offer up a word of prayer here, and, uh, and we'll dive into, into the word here. So, Lord, we commit this time to you, Father. Please speak to us, and may our hearts be open, Lord. And whatever, uh, whatever thoughts or struggles we might have in life today, pray that we could set them on the shelf right now. And just know, know that at 12 o'clock when we're done here, you know, they're going to still be there, probably. <laughs> Um, but we want to just receive from you right now, God, so yeah. we can leave this place better able to navigate this crazy world that we live in, Lord. Amen. And so uh, speak to us, we pray, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, Joe, were you able to get that slide made? Yes, sir. Yeah. We're going to start something up that we used to do. You have questions, text them in. <laughs> and uh, this is something we did for years at Cornerstone 1.0. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the sermon, um, I try to answer questions. And so this is not definitely not stump the pastor. That's not the goal, because that's not hard. And, uh, but uh, sometimes, you know, I, I don't want anybody, people leave, anybody leaving here after having heard a message to be confused about anything. And so if you have any questions about the message in particular or anything in general about the Christian life, uh, your text will be received. It will be anonymous to the church, and so you can feel free to ask that question that's been bothering you or, or whatever the case may be. So let's dive in here. First Samuel chapter 18. Uh, Saul has made very clear here in the first part of chapter 18 that he is absolutely against David. And so we're going to be seeing here uh, the development of his anger and hatred and jealousy uh, towards David. So let's read starting at verse 17. Then Saul said to David, here is my oldest daughter Merab. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So David said to Saul, what am I and what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it happened at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel the Mehotholite as a wife. Now David had killed Goliath, and, and Saul had said to, to his troops, whoever kills Goliath, I'll give, you know, give one of my daughters to be married. You're marrying into the royal family, so it's a big deal. So Saul has already defaulted on that, or hasn't kept his promise so far. So as the custom goes in the ancient days, uh, the first daughter would be the one that would be married off. Married off, that sounds like getting rid <laughs> Out the door, you know, kind of, that's not what I meant. And so, yeah, there goes my... Every invitation to a wedding that I would have ever <laughs> What I want us to notice is that Saul uses his two daughters here. He doesn't care about their emotions. I mean, as a father, you care about the emotions of your children, or you should anyway. 
but he's using his kids as leverage to get to get to David. And his, his, the first thing that he's going to do here is that he's going to say, David, basically this, yeah, you don't have any money for a dowry. And a dowry was basically a bride gift ahead of time so that if the, the marriage didn't work out, uh, she would be left with some kind of financial support or something. And David here knows, uh, I, don't, I don't have any money. So he says, what he's going to be telling him is, just, just bring me the foreskins of 100 Philistines. <laughs> I mean, that's just <laughs> disgusting. You know? But what he's trying to do is he's trying to get David killed. Yeah. And he's, he says, I don't want to be blamed for that. So I'll just make it look like I'm giving him a break instead of him trying to round up some money or possessions or things like that. Uh, he can just go fight our enemies. And it'll be kind of a two for one. We'll be, we'll be conquering some of our enemies and, and he'll, he'll have a bride gift and he can come back and marry my daughter. And I'm actually kind of giving him a break. So let's look at the notes here. Verse 17, Saul hated David so much he was willing to use his daughter as an excuse to cause him to be killed. He's absolutely indifferent indifferent to his daughter's feelings. He says there, be valiant for me. And David's a warrior, and David's loyal, and he's playing upon David's sense of loyalty and David's sense of, of, of the military rightness of fighting against the Philistines. He's, he knows how to, Saul's a manipulator. Yeah. Guys, when we are jealous of people and we resent them, it's easy to manipulate, try to manipulate them or manipulate them, and even use our own flesh and blood to do it. And it's just a horrible thing. He's just playing with his daughter's uh, emotions here. In verse 18, David is saying, you know, who am I? I'm not worthy to be your son-in-law. Actually, the reverse was true. Saul wasn't worthy to have him in the family. But, but we're going to see here a consistent humility in the heart of David. I mean, David is just an outstanding uh, man at this point in his life. So Saul's original plan, he changes it. He kind of changes rules in the middle of the game. Verse 19, it happened at the time when Marab, Saul's daughter, should have been given. He gives her away to somebody else. Now, why did he do this? Maybe it took a little bit long for David to respond, or maybe Saul wants to provoke him. Maybe, Or maybe he just wants to disappoint him. He wants to stir him up. We don't know what Saul's uh, motivations are or were, but but none of them, as we are going to see here in these in these two chapters, none of his motivations are any good, and so he's just that just really bugs me that he would use his daughter uh, as a tool and as leverage to try to have a young man killed and to try to not make it look like it was his fault, and so he uses his older daughter Marab, but then she gets married and now he's got to kind of retreat. As we say in football, fall back and punt, kick the ball, try it again later in, in a little while. Look at verse 20. Now Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. Now she's the next in line. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. So he's thinking, oh, great, she loves him? Oh, great. She'll probably go flirt with him. She'll go up and do her eyebrow thing, you know, her little Bambi eyes at him. And, you know, she's going she's gonna to win him over. So Saul said, verse 21, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him. Again, not caring. Now, it's even worse, I think, with McCall because she really loves David. So there's really emotions involved here, but he doesn't care about that. Saul said, I'll give her to him that she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall be my son-in-law today. <clears throat> and Saul communicated <clears throat> his servants. <clears throat> he said, communicate with David secretly and say, look, the king has delighted you and all his servants love you. Now, therefore, become the king's son-in-law. So they're working behind the scenes. So he's using his daughter. Now he's using his servants. Verse 23, so Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, does it seem uh, to you a light thing to be the king's son-in-law, seeing I am poorly and lightly esteemed? And the servants of Saul told him, in this manner David spoke. So David here absolutely feels unworthy for this position. Now he hasn't been told about the whole thing about the, the foreskins of the Philistines yet. But he's just thinking, I don't have any money. I'm a nobody. Why should I marry into a royal family? And so he's very, very, um, very, very humble. Guys, Saul has already tried to kill David. Now, you'd think, you know, there's a lot of women in Israel. I don't need that guy for my father-in-law, you know. But he kind of just keeps coming back, and he kind of keeps looking for the good. And it just kind of, it amazes me. David, how can you just keep coming back and hoping for the best? 
And it made me think about 1 Corinthians 13. Look at your notes there. You guys know this verse. Love bears all things and believes all things, and it hopes all things, and it endures all things. And I see that verse being played out so clearly in the life of David here. He's really hoping for the best. I mean, you know, if somebody threw a spear at me once or twice, so far Saul has thrown spears twice, you'd kind of be thinking, oh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll talk across the courtyard yeah. out, of your, out of the range of your spear, you know. But I think David somehow just thinks, well, maybe he's over it. Maybe he had a bad day. You know, it says earlier that a distressing spirit from the Lord was upon him. And so maybe David's even thinking, maybe the demon's leaving him alone today, you know, or something. And he, but he just has this unusually childlike, naive hope that everything's going to be okay. And I just, I just am amazed at that. So he doesn't feel worthy to become the king's son at all. And he, the servants go and tell him, hey, the king wants you. And, and they hear what David says, and they go back and tell Saul. You know, he doesn't feel worthy to be your son-in-law. So picking up it up at verse uh, 25, Saul said, thus you shall say to David. Now he's hatching another plan. The king does not desire any dowry, but 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. So he's playing on his loyalty again and on his, on his sense of duty. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. I mean, he killed, he killed Goliath. 100, 100 Philistines is not going to be a problem. So he's thinking, I can do that. that that'll kind of save my male ego. It'll, it'll make me feel respectable. Pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now the days had not expired. Therefore David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 men of the Philistines. I mean... If 100 good is good, 200 is better, right? So why not? <laughs> and David brought their foreskins and gave them in full count to the king that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as a wife. David Gusick in his commentary is so funny. <laughs> yeah, read it. Did you read it? <laughs> he, he says, you know, so many times you wish you could just see what was going on in the Bible. I mean, see Jesus walking <laughs> on the wall. You know, this is one of those times you're like... I don't want to see this, you know. It's just a disgusting, hideous thing. So David here, you know, humorously, I'm saying this sarcastically and humorously, he has two choices. He can go talk to the Philistines and say, could I have 100, 100 volunteers to become circumcised? And I'll take your foreskins. Or, which isn't going to happen, or he has to go do it himself. And he goes and does it himself, and in fact, he, yeah. he gets 200 of them. So he was poor, but he could perform this act of public service. So... <laughs> it's making Saul look like he's a flexible, nice, generous guy, you know. Everybody knows David can't pay a bride price. Well, Saul just let him do what he's good at. And so, but in Saul's heart, uh, he wants him dead. Here's a point to notice, and please don't miss these things. Please, please read between the lines a little bit on these verses. Jealous people can look good and look honorable, but their hearts are still deceitful. And it's going to come out, and everybody's going to know it eventually. And everybody's going to know this about Saul eventually. But right now, the public you know, talk uh, on the talk channels could have been, boy, he's really giving him a break. He's letting, he's letting him bring the bride price in a way that, that he's able to do it. Isn't, isn't Saul flexible? Isn't he generous? Isn't he kind? Isn't he understanding? So David brings these foreskins. Verse 28. Thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. He's already, he's already lost his son to the love of David. Now he's losing his daughter. Hmm. And he knows that the Lord is with him. You'd think, you know, Saul, okay, how many plans are you going to try to create here? Why don't you just stop? Why don't you just repent? Why don't you just surrender? I've said this before. A friend of mine said the word surrender means to join the winning team. <laughs> join the winning side. When we surrender to the Lord, we're joining the winning side. And what a great time for him to just say, you know, David, I'm really sorry. Um, it's been in my heart to kill you, but it, clearly God is with you. And uh, you, can be, you can be king now. And uh, if you would let me serve. I mean, there's people that would have followed Saul into battle, you know. And he could have served God, he could have served the nation of Israel, he could have served David, but he's just not going to do it. Yeah. 
28 again, thus Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, and Saul was still more afraid of David. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. So Saul became David's enemy continually. David here is willing to risk his life for Saul, and Saul sees him as an enemy. Mm. Jealousy will blind you about what people really think about you, how people really feel about you. Jealousy blinds us, guys. Dude, if there's jealousy in your heart or envy, you know, don't be surprised if you have a wrong idea about somebody, like 180 degrees wrong. And uh, we just have to be so careful about those things. Verse 30, then the princes of the Philistines went out to war, and so it was whenever they went out to war that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name became highly esteemed. So David here is just winning, 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 winning. And Saul is losing, losing, losing. And uh, he still will not repent. Next chapter, verse 19. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. See, before he's doing it secretly. You know, before he was trying to, to let the Philistines do it. But now he's bringing everybody in on it. If you have jealousy and you have influence, now you build a team of assassins. Hmm. It might just be character assassination, position assassination, or actually assassination, life assassination. But now he's bringing other people in. He spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father seeks to kill you, therefore please be on your guard until morning, morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then I will observe and I will tell you. So Jonathan wants to, to, to keep David in the loop and, and protect his friend. Verse 4, Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to his Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you. His works have been very good toward you. I mean, that was obvious. There was no denying that. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, the Goliath. And the Lord brought about a great delivery for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Come on, Dad. You were happy about him. You were glad you brought him into the house right away. What, is, what has gotten into you, Dad? Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Mm. He's not saying, Dad, you're having a bad day. He's saying, Dad, you're sinning. He doesn't sugarcoat it at all. Um, he's being very, very upfront. He's not trying to stay out of it. He's not staying neutral. He's being very blunt with his father. By the way, you know, if Dad sits in the palace with a spear all the time, he's, he's, not, a, he's not a safe guy to be blunt to. And Jonathan is here just being very honest and open. Verse 6, so Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. And so now he's swearing in the name of God. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. There's a temporary reprieve from the hatred of Saul against David, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be permanent. I want you guys to, to notice, and please, you know, put on, put on your thinking caps and kind of lean into the text a little bit. Saul's mind is convinced, but we're going to see that his heart's not convinced. And sometimes, you know, people might talk to us about a particular bad attitude that we have, and at the end of the conversation, we, we can't deny except that they're right. Yeah, you're right. I did this, I said that, and that person's not what I said they are, and, and so on and so forth. And we're intellectually agreeing with the situation. But then we kind of retreat back into our feelings. You know, We know in our minds, but it just doesn't make its way into our heart. The truth, obviously, guys, has to enter our mind, but then it has to drop, as they say, those 18 inches and get down into our heart. And it never makes it past Saul's mind. He just, he will not let his heart be softened by the Lord here. Look at verse 6. So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan and swore as the Lord lives and shall not be killed. Jonathan called David and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul as, and he was in his presence as, as in time past. And there was war again and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow and they fled from him. 
I want us to turn over, if, if you would, guys, to Matthew chapter 12, just for a moment. And we're not going to do a lot of page turning today, but uh, this, this, is, this is right at the heart of what we're looking at here. Matthew 12, verse 33. Hmm. Matthew 12, 33 says this, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. A tree is known by its fruit. Mm. Right now, Saul, the roots of his heart are still bad. Therefore, the fruit is going to be bad. He's, he's mouthing the right words, but the nature and essence of who he is is bad, and it's going to be known by the fruit. Somebody could say all day long, it's okay, David can come back, David can come back, David can come back. And then you get him in a tough moment, he's got a spear in his hand, and we're going to see it again, he's going to throw it again. His heart is unchanged. Verse 34, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. I say to you that every idle word that men may speak, they will give an account of it on judgment day. By your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. Mm -hmm. So here, you know, Saul, if we're going to understand that verse in application to this, he's saying it's okay to keep David in the, in the palace, but he's going to go against it. He's going against what he said because his heart isn't changed. Dear brothers and sisters, I, I pray regularly, God, help me be a good man. Not just do good things. Help me be a good man. Help me, you know, one of the phrases that God put on my heart as we reorganize the church, to love God deeply and love people sincerely. And sometimes we love people just out of responsibility or obligation. Somebody needs a ride and we, uh, if nobody else will do it, I guess I will. You know, that, at least you got them somewhere, but that's not loving them sincerely. Sincerely means without any hypocrisy, but in reality with truth, you know. And I, I pray this kind of prayer. God, make me a good tree. <laughs> I want to have I want to be a good tree because if I'm a good man I'll have good fruit yeah. you know I need to take care of my inner life and my soul my soul health my soul care I need to take care of my soul in regards to protecting it and keeping it healthy and feeding it and, and, and walking in God's spirit and, and reading God's word and being changed by him and so you know you do too we all do we have to take care of our lives with the Lord as I look here in this room, we have a room full of saved people. Fantastic. That's just the beginning. You know, is there good fruit coming out of your life? There needs to be good fruit, and it doesn't happen unless the tree is good. And all the DNA of Jesus is inside of us for good works, you know. But we have to be deliberate about, deliberate about those things. Saul here, he's, he's agreeing mentally. He's assenting verbally. He's not a changed man. All we have to do, if you're wondering about somebody, you know, what kind of person are they? All you got to do is wait. <laughs> all True. you got to do is wait, and you'll, and you'll see. And they'll see what kind of person you are. <laughs> yeah. So, aren't you glad you came to church on Sunday this morning, and <laughs> pastor's beating you up, and <laughs> so mean, and all that, and just, you know, we're going to have a good thrashing after the service. You know, if you feel forward, if you feel guilty today, come forward. We're going to just beat you with rods, and everybody will go home feeling better. You know? And we have to talk about these things, you know. Don't be a Saul. Make a t-shirt, Saul, red light, red sword. Don't be a Saul, you know, be a David. David's hoping ridiculously beyond hope, because that's what hope does. That's what love does. Saul here... All he can do is say the right words. He doesn't do the right thing. Verse 9. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear. But he, think, you know, he thought today's church was tough. <laughs> Saul sought to, to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. Very interesting for me. It, did, it just did not take long. You know, this is the next season. We don't know how long between verses 8 and 9 there was another season of war and David's victorious. 
and, and some time passed, but, but Saul has not really changed. I, I found it very interesting. Look at verse 9 again. The distressing spirit came from the Lord, and that's just that God allowed a demonic spirit to, to, to harass Saul and oppress him and speak into his mind. A distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul when? As he sat in the house with a spear in his hand. It didn't say that it came upon him and then he got the spear in his hand. As he had the spear in his hand, then the distressing spirit came upon him. If you know, guys, there's a thin veil between this world and the invisible world. There's a thin veil. And, you know, demons are, are, are watching, and Satan is watching. Hmm. And it says he, prow he, roars, he prowls around like a roaring lion, looking at whom he may devour. And all of his little lion clubs, they're, cubs are all looking too. Who can we devour? We need to stir up some murder in somebody. Who are you going to look for? The guy with a with paddle ball? Paddle? Hmm. Pickleball? Pickleball? Is that what you mean? <laughs> that looks like a good game for me. You only have to take like two steps each way. I think I can... Is a demon going to go after a guy with a pickleball paddle or a spear in his hand? Mm -hmm. Spear in his hand. Mm -hmm. That guy's already ready to kill. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need much of a push to get tipped over. He's already yeah. ready. And I just found it very, very interesting. The spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with a spear in his hand. Yeah. While he was already contemplating this, he didn't need much of a push. Saul should, have, should not have had a spear in his hand. What do you need a spear in your hand for when you're in your own living room? You don't need that, you know? You need a Bible in your hand. You need something else in your hand. Guitar in your hand. Yeah. Nice Epiphone guitar with really good pickups right now. J44. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I digress. You don't need, you don't need a, a weapon of murder in your hand when you're in your living room. But Saul was so filled with rage that it didn't take much of a demonic <laughs> oppression to tip him over. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes we, we blame the enemy so much for, well, he, you know, he gave me the desire. I'm not saying that Satan doesn't give us desires. But, you know, we have a few of our own. Fact. It says in the book of Ephesians, we are by nature children of wrath. Yeah. You know, our, we, our, five of our grandchildren are here this morning. They're cute as anything, but they're little sinners. <laughs> they are little sinners. And we are older sinners. So we're, we're saints in the Lord. But the old man, the old nature has not yet been shed from us, and we still have a, a tendency t towards sin. Yeah. If you're ruminating on that, if you're camping out on that, and you're planning something, it doesn't take, I mean, it just doesn't take, how, how much effort is it going to take for me to just knock that bottle over? Not much. Mm -hmm. it's, it's set for it. Mm -hmm. It's prepared for it. So be careful in your lives, guys. Saul is unraveling here. You know, the place of the palace, the place of the throne would have been where everybody who had business with the king would have gone to talk to him, to plead the case of these people over here, or there's a need over here, or this or that, or there's a city that burned down, can we help him? But everybody has to go see the king, and he's sitting there snarling with a spear in his hand. It's not a good way to lead. And he's right at the tipping point, and now he tips over. And we remember that Saul, it says in verse uh, 10, he drove the spear into the wall. He was a head taller than everybody else, remember? He's a big guy. He had spear-throwing power. And now he's using it. And, he's, and it's all because of jealousy. And it's all because of self. Verse 11. So Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So somehow she finds out about it. She probably knows how her dad operates, you know. So McCall let David down through a window. That's kind of humbling. She must have had some help. I mean, you know. And he went and fled and escaped, and McCall took an image and laid it in the bed, put a cover of goat's hair for the head, and covered it with clothes. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said he is sick. So she's understandably protecting her husband. That word image there, it's teraphim. And it's, it's kind of an idol, but it's not like a Canaanite idol. It was something that the Israelites used as kind of a, an image of God, a secondary image of God. So it was not a biblical thing. It was just some kind of, uh, you know, unspiritual custom that they developed. So that's just an image. So she, she pretends that it's David lying in the bed. You know, she's protecting her husband. Verse 14. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said he is sick. And Saul sent the messengers back to David saying, Bring him up to me in the bed. 
that I may kill him. I mean, that's wicked. I can't go to him and kill him in his bed, so bring him here to my palace while I sit here with my spear. And he, he's so weak, he can't even get out of bed. Perfect, I don't have to try too hard. I'll just run him through. I'll run the spear through him and through the bed too. I mean, it's just murderous. It's awful what has gotten into Saul's heart. Where do we leave off? 18, 18 it is. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naioth. Mm -hmm. Now it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David is at Naioth in Ramah. David here chooses to run instead of fight. David could have had a successful military coup against Saul at this point. You know, and I probably would have been fighting with David, fighting for him. You know, who would have blamed David? This guy's trying to kill you. Three attempts on your life now, you know, after all you've done for him. And David, I, he, oh, Lord, give me that kind of love for people. It's just as childlike. I say naive in, in the best sense of the word. I'm, I'm just not going to quit trying to give Saul a chance. He's just trying and trying and trying. <laughs> But he doesn't fight against him, he, he, he flees. And he goes to a man that's gonna give him godly counsel. Two things to learn out of verse 18. David fled when he could have stayed and fought and nobody would have blamed him. But he knows if I take the, the throne by force, that's not, the, that's not the thing that God has for me. I'm not gonna do anything unless the Lord directs me to. Even though, humanly speaking, I have a right to. And then in verse 19, or verse 18, he goes to Samuel. When you're in trouble, guys, find godly counsel. Don't find somebody that's going to throw spears with you. Find godly counsel. And he's, I'm sure he just sat down with Samuel, and they had a long talk, and Samuel's going to give him kind of a bro hug here. And just, you're doing the right thing, and... Yeah, Saul's out of his mind, and everybody knows that you're innocent, and he's kind of reinforcing him, you know? So, if you're in a David situation right now, go find a Samuel. Yeah. And uh, if you're a Samuel, then good for you, because you're the kind of person that people want to go to. Mm -hmm. You know, I hope and pray that each one of us in here, as followers of Jesus, whether, whether people are Christians or not, that they find that they can come to you. Saw a great little meme on Facebook. There's not too many anymore. <laughs> but I like a good treasure hunt. <laughs> Who doesn't? And it said, don't just invite people to your church. Invite them into your life. Mm -hmm. Invite people into your life. And get to know them. Yeah. Uh, I, there was a, a phrase bouncing around a few years ago about the third place. The first place is home. The second place is work. The third place is what for you? Church. Church? Okay, besides that, you're ruining my thing, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Give me 10 push ups, right? <laughs> the, th the third place might be like where our kids have sports or where you go for recreation or, you know. Friendship? Friendship, yeah. The third place is where you can invite people into your life. And so, you know, that, that helps to make us Samuels. That helps to make people know that they can trust you. You know, there's going to be a first time that, somebody's, that somebody trusts you. But if on the first time that they trust you, they've already thought about it 20 times. And they finally got the courage to go do it. And that takes time. David knew that he could go to Samuel. He doesn't fight back. Verse 19. Now it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David is at Naioth in Ramah. So Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. The word prophesied there is translated like they began to give praise to God. They began to honor and acknowledge God along with the prophets. They got caught up in the spiritual moment. The Holy Spirit came upon these men. They came with, with at least the intent to help Saul find David to kill him, or they came with murderous intent. But the Holy Spirit just fell upon these guys, and they were changed at that moment, at least for that short season. And who was behind that? God. 
I'm going to turn your assassins into worshipers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Verse 21. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. So you, 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 don't, you can't commend Saul for his intentions, but he sure is relentless. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. So he figures, I'll just go do it, you know. Then he also went to Ramon and came to the great well that is at Seku, Sechu, and he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they are at Naoth in Ramon. So he went there to Naoth in Ramon. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also. <laughs> and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. Saul goes with murderous intent. This isn't just about, wow, what an amazing thing God did to Saul. This is, a, this is like what an amazing thing God did for David. Yeah. He turns my assassins into worshipers. That would not have happened had David started fighting back. David never would have seen that. You don't think that's an encouragement to David? Oh my goodness. God is changing the hearts of men as they come with spears and swords. He's changing them on the way. What an amazing, amazing experience for David. Verse 23, so he went there to Naoth and Ramah. Then the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. Verse 24, and he also stripped off his clothes. They were in their loincloths. I don't think they were naked. It's the, the Hebrew allows for that, you know. And he also stripped off his clo clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all night, again, in, in undergarments. All day and all night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Mm -hmm. There's just... You just have to wonder, like, Saul, what is God going to have to do? Like, turn you into a frog? <laughs> and, and probably then he still won't change, you know? There's so much evidence that God is working on behalf of David. Look down at the, at the last little section there on your notes. Saul pursues David. We see the Holy Spirit moving upon these messengers in a powerful way. That's evidence to Saul that God is for David. Perhaps these messengers were indifferent, but Saul was definitely not interested in the things of God. Yet the Holy Spirit comes upon them and Saul, and they fall prostrate on the ground naked, worship before God. God changed their hearts and protected David. And what happens after that? Saul goes back to wanting to kill David. It just speaks to us so much that you can have a genuine Holy Spirit experience in a moment. Yeah. But that doesn't change your heart. Yeah. Changing your heart has to be something that you agree with God about. Right. These guys did not go looking for this. God overpowered them by his spirit, and they got caught up in the moment. But Saul is not converted here. God, Saul is not changed. He's just still a murderous man. God can overcome anyone by his spirit, but that doesn't mean that this life is surrendered to God. When the spiritual experience is over, Saul was still a murderous, insanely jealous man. Finally, the last part at the bottom there. So important for us. Jesus said, the world will know we are his disciples, not by our prophesying or miracles or church services or t-shirts or concerts or music or bumpers, or blah, 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 all that stuff, but, but what? By our pure love for one another. When the world sees you loving people sincerely, and to love people sincerely means you got to die. You've got to die to yourself to love people sincerely. Mm -hmm. I can go give somebody a ride with a bad attitude, and I can fake a smile between here and SFO. Mm -hmm. I can, I can do. It depends on who the person is. Yeah. And if I time it just right, guitar center's open on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I can fake it, but I don't want to fake it. I want to love people sincerely. I really want to be able to say. I wanted to do this, but you know what, Lord? You have me to love this person right now. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to die to myself. I need to die to myself. Jesus, you said if I'm going to follow you, I need to pick up my cross daily and follow you. That means death to me. Saul would have none of that. And David would just embrace it over and over and over again. We're going to see him have multiple chances to kill Saul, but he just will not do it. He's not going to take control over his own life, guys. As, as followers of Jesus, may we not think that we can take control over our own lives. 
We have to be people that say, yes, Lord. So let's practice that together. One, two, three. Yes, yes Lord. Lord. Good, you're on your way. <laughs> let's stand together and pray. If you need prayer, prayer today, there's, we're going to be here. You know where to find us. Lord, we don't want to be like Saul, who is really, a, in so many ways, a type of Satan trying to kill David, who is a type of Jesus. Lord, we want to be like David. We want to be men and women who have hearts after you. Who even when we can fight, we, we follow your lead and, and choose not to fight, but to trust you. So Lord, have your way with us, we pray. May, may Napa know each one of us in this room. May, may everybody that knows us be sure that we're a Christian. May, may people just know because we're so different, so full of your Holy Spirit, so full of your love, sincerely loving people and deeply loving you. So Lord, thank you that because of the cross of Christ, this whole thing got started, our sins paid for, our forgiveness secured, and then you're working out your ways in us, Lord. So have your way, we pray. In Jesus' name. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Oh, questions. See? Any questions? No questions. Go have lunch. Go enjoy lunch.